foreordination. Let's talk about foreordination. Those are assignments that we receive before we're born, given to us by Heavenly Father on account of our faithfulness in keeping His commandments in the first estate, in the premortal life. When it says foreordination, we can take that literally. That means that hands are laid on our heads and we're ordained to some mission, some assignment that Heavenly Father has given us as we counseled with Him. He trusts us. We've proven our abilities in the premortal life to do certain things. And in His wisdom, what He does is assign us during our time on earth to use those talents and abilities that we develop there to bless His other children. That's accompanied with an ordination. Hands are laid upon our head, and we have we receive from Father in Heaven blessings, power, for us to fulfill that foreordained mission. Uh, another word that could be used to describe that would be destiny, destiny. The prophet Joseph Smith, in the uh, lectures on faith, said, It's critical for us to know, through revelation, that the path that we're pursuing is acceptable to the Lord. We need to have a witness through revelation that the path that we're pursuing is acceptable to him. That path that you're pursuing needs to be the one that you were foreordained to pursue before you came here. And he'll let you know if you're on that path and if the direction you're going at this point is acceptable and that he's pleased with that. Where's the reference on that? Um, the reference on that is Mike Stroud, chapter 13, verse 3. <laughs> Lectures on faith. Lectures on faith number six and number four. Number six. Mm -hmm. uh, four and six. That the path that we're pursuing is acceptable to the Lord. And you need to find that out through Revelation. That'll help you get a feel for your foreordained mission and calling. Now the doctrine of election means that you were elected before you were born to fulfill this mission on account of you your decisions, and the choices you make before you came here. You obtain a favorability status, a favored status with the Lord because of who you were and what you did before you came here. Now that election means that, here's, here's the bottom line. It ties in with, with our, with the premortal life. Some people come into this life with an advantage because of who they were and what they did before they were born. See, all of these things tie together. Election, foreordination, destiny. The same thing applies in this life. If we do what we're supposed to in this life, when we leave this life and go into the next world, we go either with an advantage or a disadvantage. Where you are, who you are, and what you're doing, the privileges you enjoy in this life are a direct result of who you were, what you did before you were born. That's the doctrine of election. You can look that up in your Bible dictionary, and it basically says that you come into favorable contact in this life with the gospel, with priesthood, with the ordinances of the temple, with all of the things, and I would include with the birth where you're born at the time you're born, are all given to you, are all rewards, if you will, for what you did, how faithful you were in serving the Lord before you came here. Now, we know that's a true principle because we know that uh, after this life, there are going to be more desirable, a place to be that will be more desirable than other places. So, what you do here is going to determine what kind of blessings you enjoy in the next world. Just back that up one estate, and it's the same thing. What you're enjoying here, if you're enjoying the privileges of a favored citizenship, if you're born under circumstances where you come into favorable contact with the gospel, the priesthood, and all that, that's all tied in to who you were and what you did in the world before this one. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so if we're a pioneer, we went through all of that, and uh, are we came into homes that were not as uh, strong? How does that all fit into this, Mike? Well, it's hard. It's hard to come out and say that if you're in a home with your abused, that that was because you didn't do what you should before you're born. I'm not saying that because ultimately, 
any experience that appears to be negative on at, at face value can end up to be one of your greatest blessings. So I'm just going to say that when it's all said and done, that there are people who enjoy favorability status. Come into, this is what the Bible Dictionary says, they come into favorable contact with these things. Now to break that down, and individual households and lives and so on, is too complicated to do that, isn't it? There are just too many ins and outs. But, but in a general sense, the blessings that you enjoy in this life, that give you a favorable condition, are the result of who you were and what you did before you came here. That's that's as far as we can go on that. Now, if you want to look under your Bible dictionary, under the doctrine of election, it says this. This is on page 662 in your Bible dictionary. And it says that election of grace has reference to one's situation in mortality. That is, here we go, being born at a time and at a place and in circumstances. Do you see those things right there? Where you're born the time you're born, the place you're born, and the circumstances of your birth, where one will come in favorable contact with the gospel. This election took place in the pre-mortal existence. So that all ties in with foreordination and election of grace. All of these things are all tied in together. Alma is talking about that in the 13th chapter. Let's go to that for just a minute. Alma chapter 13. Let's see if we can break this down. I remember the first time I read Alma chapter 13. I, I read it through and then I said, what the heck did he just say? What was that all about? And let me just say that if you look at your chapter heading in Alma chapter 13, men are called as high priests because of their exceeding faith and good works. Let's stop right there. The high priests that they're talking about here are not the high priests that we have in the states of the church right now. That's the first thing we need to understand. Alma's talking about something completely different here. He's talking about a priesthood order that they enjoyed in their day, which we do not have available to the general membership of the church, unless you enter the temple. If you never enter the temple as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you cannot even begin to touch what Alma's talking about here in the 13th chapter, and that priesthood order that's referred to throughout the Book of Mormon. So the high priests we're talking about here are high priests of what they call the holy order. Now we've talked a little bit about this in the past, and we talked about institutional priesthood and patriarchal priesthood. We talked about priesthood that can be received by the laying on of mortal hands, and we've talked about another order of priesthood that can only be received through immortal hands, and so we're talking about a higher order of the priesthood here. Go back to the chapter heading. They are, cho- they are called as high priests because of their exceeding faith and good works. Dash. They are to teach the commandments, righteousness. They are sanctified and enter into the rest of the Lord. The first, now here's the best thing to help you on Alma 13. The first nine verses are talking about the pre-mortal world. That will help you. There is, a, there is a, a division in this chapter. The first nine are talking about what takes place in the pre-mortal world. So when it talks about in verse 1, it talks about priests who are ordained after his holy order. We're talking about something that took place they were foreordained to before they were born. Look at verse 2. Those priests were ordained after the order of his son in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to his son for redemption. And this is the manner after which they were ordained. Now here's your key, watch. Being called and prepared from the foundation of the world, according to the foreknowledge of God. That's foreordination in the pre-mortal world. And here's why it took place. On account of their exceeding faith and good works. And you would ask where? You would have to say the first estate. There are men and women who excelled in the first estate. And because of their excellence, which is where the word excel comes from, because of their excellence, they received a more desirable ordination. And the Lord used them because of their exceeding faith and good works 
to be the leaders. Abraham said that Abraham saw these noble and great souls. He said, the Lord said, these I will make my rulers. So there's a group of souls that excelled in the premortal life. Let's go back to verse 3. On accounting their exceeding faith and good work. In the first place, premortal life, being left to choose good or evil, therefore, they having chosen good and exercised exceeding great faith, are called with a holy calling in the premortal world. Yea, with that holy calling which was prepared with and according to a preparatory redemption for such. The preparatory redemption is another key that is taking you into the pre-mortal world. Because the actual redemption doesn't take place until we get down into the telestial world where we become spotted with sins and with corruption, etc., etc., when we're out of the presence of the Lord. Now look at verse 4. Thus they have been called to this holy calling on account of their faith in the premortal life, while others would reject the Spirit of God in the premortal life on account of the hardness of their hearts and blindness of their minds. While if they had not been for this rejection, they might have had as great a privilege as their brethren. There's your, there's your excellent. Not everybody's the same. Some pass their first estate, like Abraham chapter 3 says, and others failed the first estate. Verse 5, we're in fine in the first place. They were on the same standing with their brethren. In other words, they had the same opportunity. All the sons and daughters of God have the same opportunities. God is not a respecter of persons, and there is no in him no shadow of changing. But as here, so it was there, some chose to be valiant, to be steadfast, to be immovable, and others were casual in their approach. And as a result, did not receive as desirable an election as others. It's the same thing here. All we're doing is we're repeating in a mortal state what took place in an immortal, premortal state. And the purpose in verse uh, verse 6, And thus being called by this holy calling and ordained unto this high priest of the holy order of God to teach the commandments unto the children of men that they also might enter into his rest. Didn't. doesn't say they did. It says they might. So the whole purpose here is to prepare people so they can enter into something called The rest of the Lord. Now here's the challenge in this world. Men who are ordained to the priesthood in this life were foreordained to that priesthood before they came here. If you hold the Melchizedek priesthood in this life, you were ordained to that priesthood before you came here. That's the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, where he teaches that. Now you can be foreordained to have that ordination in this life, and choose out so that you forfeit it, and many do. That's the purpose of the lesson I want to talk to you tonight, is that we have this foreordination, but you can be effectively, and here's going to be the the title of tonight's lesson, you can be effectively neutralized. You can be effectively neutralized. And most of the Melchizedek priesthood of the church has been effectively neutralized. Now, this neutralization comes for a number of reasons. The number one reason, in my feeling, is is that we become casual in our approach to the doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lucifer puts us to sleep to a degree that we think that what we know and what we enjoy is all there is. For example, if you were to teach in any class in the church that there is priesthood ordinations above what we experience in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you would find almost without exception that it's unknown and unbelieved. And yet, what I want to propose to you is that what we're seeing in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is foundational and is trying to teach us to come up and obtain something more significant. Everything in the gospel, brothers and sisters, is designed to move you in a transitional way from something lower to something higher. Everything. If you can grab a hold of that concept and that principle, it really makes a lot of things that we see in the church and around us in our views, it makes sense. For example... We're continually talking to the members in church today. The assignment was on paying your tithing. 
and we continue to talk about paying the tithing, and we talk about uh, Malachi chapter 3, will a man rob God, and we talk about section 119, and we, we quote all these scriptures, and that's good, and that's appropriate. But if people can understand that tithing is a principle that's trying to transition you from something less to something greater, from something lower to something higher. If we could understand that tithing is a transitional principle to try and take you to something better, then we might find a little better or a little different success on the principle. Instead of making people feel guilty that they're robbing God, would you rob, will a man rob God? Oh my gosh, I don't want to rob God. Well, you're robbing God if you don't pay your tithing. So we can shame you into that, and we can make you feel guilty and say, well, I don't want to rob God, he's been so good to me, etc., etc. Or we can teach them that everything you're being taught in the gospel is designed to transition you from where you're at to something higher, more noble, more profound, and with greater blessings. Then that's a different view of things. Does that make sense? Everything yes. will look at it that way. It's the same with priesthood. The Lord has so many things. It's the same with the church. The Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, is not the end result. You're looking for membership in a different church, folks. As you join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you're not through, you're just beginning. It's foundational. It's transitional. It's trying to transition you from membership in this organization into membership into the Church of the Firstborn. Your next step is membership in the Church of the Firstborn. When you came into this church, you came in through a process of investigation. And you were given certain things to study, and there were missionaries that uh, instructed you and moved you forward and gave you challenges and made you promises, taught you principles, and then taught you how to go to God and get an answer as to the truthfulness of this whole message of the resurrection. Well, when you're now involved, you folks right now are involved in investigating the Church of the Firstborn. Everything that we teach on this podcast, everything that we teach on this podcast is designed to introduce you into the Church of the Firstborn. The temple is the beginning of instruction and ordinances into the Church of the Firstborn. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been referred to as the Outer Church. We used to have a hymn that we sang that's not in the hymn book anymore called the Outward Church Below. The Outward Church church below. You can look that up their website. And we need to be a part of the outward church below. Below is the telestial world. That's the below. And the outward church is a physical outward institution that is run by mortal men and women. That's the outward church. When you enter the temple, the first ordinance you participate in is the initiatory. The initiatory is an initiation. You're being initiated into something else. You're now leaving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you're being initiated into the Church of the Firstborn, which, by the way, is the inward church above. So you've got the outward church below, and you've got the inward church above. The above is terrestrial. It's the next estate. It's millennial third estate. You are now in a mortal telestial second estate. The next estate is millennial terrestrial third estate, and the organization of that state is the Church of the Firstborn. Uh, Sharon and I went to the temple yesterday, and as I was in the temple, I noticed particularly that most of the temple ceremony is uh, Adam and Eve singing, and Adam and Eve being separated from the presence of uh, Elohim, and, and then eventually from, from Jehovah, except for sending witnesses down. That, that particular part took almost 20 or 30, 30, 40 minutes to do that. And then and then we, you know, progressed to the different uh, stages, and that didn't come long. And my thought was that uh, that's where all the work has to be done for us to change and not become hard-hearted all behind. Does that make sense? It does. Good point. So what you're doing in the initiatory, which is a four-booth staged anoint, uh, uh, ordinance, you're going through four booths. Each one of the four booths represent the four estates of probation. The first one is your pre-mortal life. 
The second booth is mortality. The third booth is the millennial terrestrial world. And the fourth booth is the celestial kingdom where Father dwells. And you're being taught that as you go through. All of this is designed to introduce you into something else. I heard a person say that, and you've heard me say this before, that the member of the church that never makes it to the temple, his membership is frustrated. Because the purpose of membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is foundational, and it's designed to transition you into the Church of the Firstborn. All of the ordinances of the temple, Brigham Young said, are ordinances of the Church of the Firstborn. All of the ordinances. So what you're there being instructed in is how to obtain step-by-step through ordinances the Church of the Firstborn. When you become a member of the Church of the Firstborn, brothers and sisters, you have entered into the rest of the Lord. Now go with me back to Alma chapter 13. Let's just skip over a page here. And I want you to look at verse 11 and 12. Now think about this, okay? Now in verses 10 through, on through the rest of the chapter, you're talking about immortality. So verses 1 through 9 is talking about pre-mortal life. 10 through 31 are talking about in this world, in this life. Verse 11, Therefore they were called after this holy order and were sanctified, and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. If you want to see that actual process described vividly, read 3 Nephi chapter 19. 3 Nephi 19 is the Book of Mormon account of what verse 11 is talking about, where it says they were sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now look at verse 12. And they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. Semicolon, and I love this part. And there were many, an exceeding great many, who were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. The rest of the Lord is a terrestrial place. You have membership in the church of the firstborn. You have obtained a higher order of priesthood we've talked about before. You have had heavenly hands laid upon you. You have obtained promises from God himself with his own mouth calling you by your name which is your first trip to the veil. When you go to the veil in the temple, the first time you go up, you go there twice. The first time you go is to obtain from God promises. You speak with him through the veil. You don't see him. You hear his voice. And then the second time you go up to the veil, you enter into his presence. The first trip to the veil is called making your calling and election sure. It's the same as the more sure word of prophecy where you obtain from his, from him personally to you intimately calling you by name and you hearing his voice but not seeing his presence. You obtain promises that effectively brings you into and makes you a member of the church of the firstborn and opens the door for you to now have the next level, which is called the second comforter, where you have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Personally. When those things happen, you have obtained membership in the church of the firstborn and have entered into the rest of the Lord. One of the names of the Holy Ghost and one of the names of Christ is the comforters. They comfort you. I believe Heavenly Father is also a comforter, even though it's not referred to in Scripture. The first comforter is the Holy Ghost, and the second comforter is the Jesus Christ himself. Meaning that you are in no more in turmoil. You have no more questions concerning your standing. You have obtained promises that give you an inheritance with the Lord and part and portion with him. And at that point, you are at rest concerning your status with him and your future with him. It's a, you're at rest. There's no more concern. You're comforted, you're consoled, and you are at rest. There's no more turmoil concerning what is my standing with God. Does that make sense to you? Does that sound okay? Now, church is trying to bring us up to this point. And last general conference, 
a remarkable thing took place. Talk was given by President Russell M. Nelson. It was the opening address of the priesthood session. I want to read to you just a couple of things and just listen to this and ponder this. He has several fears. He lists two or three fears that he has. Here's fear number one. I fear that there are too many men who have been given the authority of the priesthood but who lack priesthood power. Because the flow of power has been blocked by sins such as laziness, dishonesty, pride, immorality, or preoccupation with the things of the world. Think of the word neutralized. I'm going to give you those things again. We don't have priesthood power among the brethren because of laziness, dishonesty, pride, immorality, or preoccupation with the things of this world. Here's another scripture that ties into this. Section 121, verse 32 through 34 says, Behold, many are called, but few are chosen. You've heard that a, a thousand times, right? You need to ask yourself the question, what does it mean to be called, and what does it mean to be chosen? And why are they not chosen? And then he gives the reason. Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world, and they aspire for the honors of men. Neutralized. Let me say it again. Their hearts are set upon the things of this world. So we disqualify ourselves from these upper level blessings because of these reasons. Your hearts are set upon the things of the world, and you aspire for the honors of men, laziness, dishonesty, pride, immorality, and a preoccupation with worldly things. Here's a second fear. I fear there are too many priesthood bearers who have done little or nothing to develop their ability to access the powers of heaven. See, there's a difference between being ordained to the priesthood and having priesthood power. There's only one place anywhere where this term power in the priesthood is mentioned, and that's at the most sacred place, at the most sacred moment, at the veil in the temple of the Lord. It's the only place that term's used power in the priesthood. So his second fear is, too many priesthood bearers have done little or nothing to develop their ability to access the powers of heaven. Third fear, I fear that many have sadly surrendered their agency to the adversary and are saying by their conduct, I care more about satisfying my own desires than I do about bearing the Savior's power to bless others. That's pure that's fear number three. We surrender our agency. Neutralize. So who neutralizes us? We do. We make choices that take away light. Light and truth, brothers and sisters, are the same things. They're not different things. Light is truth and truth is light. And section 88 comes out and says, truth shineth. Well, of course it does, because truth is light. And it's the food of righteousness. That's what causes us to thrive. Now, fourth fear. I fear, brethren, that some among us one may one day wake up and realize what power in the priesthood really is and face the deep regret that they spent far more time seeking power over others or power at work than learning to exercise fully the power of God. This talk is a shift in the direction of the church. I prophesy, Stroud chapter 26, verse 3, that this is a major shift by prophets and apostles to move us to a place where we are not yet, and have not been, and as a matter of fact, losing ground to get there. Now, look at this. This I've got underlined, capitalized, bold, and in red. When he said this, I just almost wanted to jump off off the chair and say, Hallelujah. President Nelson <laughs> said this. Listen okay. carefully to this. I urgently plead, this is after your four fears, I urgently plead with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. Period. Here we go. In a coming day, and I want to testify to you that day is near. In a coming day, 
only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself. Now, if you're like me, before I was tuned into these things, I would say, oh, that's nice. Christ will teach me through his prophets and through his apostles, through my bishop, through my stake president, anywhere but himself. I want you to not rest that scripture. I Don't rest this, W-R-E-S-T. Don't wrestle yeah. with this. Take it at face value because that's the way President Nelson wants it to be taken. I know it is. Only those who take their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself, watch, will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. So if you want to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others, you have to have an encounter with Christ and be taught by him. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. Whoa, what a blessing that is. Now at the end of that same priesthood session, President Monson gets up. I'm telling you, there was a shift. The Lord is working through his servants to wake us up and bring us up. Wake up and rise up. He tells this story. He says, during World War II, a friend of mine was serving in the South Pacific when his plane was shot down over the ocean. He and the other crew members successfully parachuted from the burning plane, inflated their little rafts, and clung to those rafts for three days. On the third day, they spotted what they knew to be a rescue vessel. It passed by them. The next morning, it passed by them again. They began to despair as they realized that this was the last day the rescue vessel would be in the area. Here we go. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to my friend, quote, You have the priesthood. Command the rescuers to pick you up, unquote. He did as prompted, quote, In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the priesthood, turn about and pick us up, unquote. Within a few minutes, the vessel was beside them, helping them on deck. A faithful and worthy bearer of the priesthood, in, here's a key, in his extremity, had exercised that priesthood, blessing his life and the lives of others. And I will tell you, brothers and sisters, we're not going to come up to this level without extreme experiences. You're just not going to do that. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to sacrifice and do whatever's necessary to have power over the elements? Go with me to Jacob chapter 4. Let's look what these Nephites did. These Nephites were amazing. Jacob chapter 4, through this priesthood order that they had, that you and I can have. The message is, we have access to this. There's no reason why we can't have this same thing. The holy order, and you're introduced into it and taught the beginning teachings of the holy order take place in the temple. It begins with an ordinance called the initiatory. Now, Jacob chapter 4, and let's go to verse 5, talking about the prophets which lived before him. They, be, they, be, they believed in Christ and worshipped the Father in his name. Also, we worship the Father in his name. And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our swords, souls towards him. And for this cause, it is sanctified unto us. See, I taught here a week or so ago that I believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to us what the law of Moses was to the Nephites. It's pointing us towards something higher. Now, verse 6, therefore, wherefore, we search the prophets. We have many revelations in the spirit of prophecy. Having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, and our faith becometh unshaken, insomuch that we can truly command in the name of Jesus, and the very trees obey us, the mountains or the waves of the sea. That's where we need to be. Sisters, your job is to help your husband come up to that level of priesthood power. He can't reach this level unless he meets the Lord. And sisters, you are a help me, not a help mate, a help me. And for you and your husband to enjoy this level of priesthood power and blessings, you have to work together. 
Sisters, help your husband meet the Lord so that he can have that encounter and you'll be blessed with the riches of eternity as you do that. Any questions or comments on this thus far? Can you see how easy it is to neutralize this whole thing, to stop this? Yeah. Can you see that being casual, casual is the one thing, casual in your membership is one of the things that neutralizes you? Can you see that thinking that you have everything that the Lord has to offer through your membership? Just because you're not hearing it in general conference, just because you're not hearing it spoken by the brethren, doesn't mean it's not there. The brethren speak of the lesser portion of the word. Everything you hear in church, everything you hear in general conference, every manual, every lesson, every talk, is the lesser portion of the word. Now, if you won't harden your heart, and one of the ways you harden the heart is that you assume that what you're hearing is all there is. If you won't harden your heart, and ask, seek, and knock for more, the Lord will begin step by step to present you to the greater portion of the word, which he refers to as the mysteries of God. Hardening your heart, Book of Mormon term, hardly ever used in the Bible. Hardening your heart means you refuse to listen to, heed the promptings of the light of Christ the Holy Spirit. You make a choice to not heed that light. That's hardening your heart. And if your heart's hard, all you will ever have is the lesser portion, and what's more, you continue to harden your heart, and even the lesser portion will begin to fade until what you know, you lose that, and you come to a state where you know nothing. And that's what Alma calls, chapter 12, the chains of hell. Good stuff. Now let's close up tonight's lesson by going over to uh, the Job Smith translation. JST, and it's right after your Bible dictionary. Right after your Bible dictionary and before the gazetteer or gazetteer or whatever you want to call it and the maps. Okay? Joseph Smith translation. Now what President Nelson's trying to get us to do is to come up and obtain what we're going to read about here and what we've talked about all evening. You have a foreordination and an election to these things. Satan wants to neutralize that. And he does it through many, many devices. President Nelson mentioned some of those, and we've talked about some of those. I told a group of people in class today, I was teaching the Gospel Doctrine class, and I mentioned to the group that if the Savior were to come into our class tonight and visit us, he would love us and bless us and smile and maybe have a nice little chuckle with us because he's cheerful. He who bids you to be of good cheer is cheerful. He has a great sense of humor. He likes to laugh. And But what he would say is this, my dear brothers and sisters, let me get serious with you for just a moment, just for a second. Here's what he'd say. You live way below your privileges and my expectations. That's what he'd say. He would say it in a loving, kind way, but it would prick us to the center, and we would know that it was true. Neutralized, living below your privileges, and below the expectations of the Holy Father and His Son. Neutralized. So let's look and see in Genesis chapter 14, verses 25 through 40. This is talking about this higher order that the Book of Mormon calls the Holy Order. And let's just look at some of the things that they can do there, which are wonderful. We've talked about this before. But let's go down to verse 28. And this is a covenant and an ordination that God makes Notice what he says in 28. This order came not, this order of the Son of God, which order came not by man, nor by the will of man. This is not something you obtain from mortal man or to an institution. Yeah, this is not institutional. Neither by father or mother. It's not patriarchal. You can't get it by lineage. You can't get it through institution. Neither by beginning of days nor end of years, semicolon, but of God. 
This has to come from him. Abraham was delivered unto, uh, 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 let's see, and thus it was delivered unto man by the calling of his own voice. Remember we talked about hearing the voice of God? Yeah. Remember the more sure word of pro- That's what this is. You receive this through the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. And the Lord says this, it will come in mine own due time, in mine own way, and according to my own will. Now let me stop and just share something to you that the Spirit taught me this last week or a week ago. I don't know if I taught you this or shared it with you. This was potent. I have trouble with patience. I don't know about you, but I have trouble with patience. Patience is tough on me. I know about these things, and I want them. Oh, how I want them. And I I say the words, I'm willing to wait patiently. I say those words in my prayer, because I know that it will come according to me, according to thine own will and thine own way, and and, accord, and in thine own due time. I, I can say those words, but inside, I'm impatient, and I find myself... Uh, why why doesn't he give me these things? He's told me that if I'll ask in faith, nothing doubting, that he will give me whatever's expedient in him. Why, why doesn't he do that? Here's what the Spirit taught me in answer to that prayer. Everything comes in equal opposites. So if you're asking for a blessing from God that could be measured on a scale of 1 to 10 out of 5, let's say the blessing you're seeking for is a five-level blessing. Then by eternal law, there has to be a number five opposition from the evil side to the blessings received from God. If you're receiving a blessing at five, you can't expect opposition to be at two, nor will it be at six or seven, but it will be at five. Now here's the question. Heavenly Father, Wants to give you that five, but here's the question. Can you handle the trial and the adversity that always accompanies it, which also is at a five? Are you prepared for that? And in my case, the Spirit says, Mike, I've got this blessing for you, but here's the opposite at the same level. And that, my son, you're not ready for. And so I was willing to say, wow, I can, I understand that now, because guess what? Father and Jesus are not in the process of damning, destroying, and losing you. They are in the business of exalting and saving you. But eternal law, eternal law demands equal time. Now, I was taught by the early brethren. And you can see it in play in the book of Job in the first two chapters. So you know what? I'm satisfied. And I'm willing to wait because I know that I'm being prepared for the opposite of the blessings I seek. And that when the time comes and the Lord gives me that blessing, it will be because in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things, I'm ready. And I won't be spiritually destroyed by the experience. Going back to Joseph Smith translation, verse 29, and it, meaning this order, which the Book of Mormon calls the holy order, and it was delivered unto man by the calling of his own voice. 30, for God having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself. Catch that? An oath through a mortal, but this is an oath direct from God's mouth that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith, here we go, to break mountains, to divide the seas. Think about the, think about the Nephites over in Jacob 4. To dry up waters and turn them out of their course. To put at defiance the armies of nations. That's what I think we're going to be looking at here before long. To divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, second comforter, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. Those are the things you can accomplish that God has in store if we will seek for them. And they begin by an initiatory ordinance in the temple. All of this begins that day you enter the temple 
and receive an initiation. Into what? The church of the firstborn. Do you have membership in it? No. But by the time you do have membership, you can do these things. These things accompany membership in the church of the firstborn. Now look at the last verse. And men, having this faith, coming up to this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. What chapter and verse was that again? That's the Joseph Smith translation. Okay, you can find that right after the Bible dictionary, and it's Genesis 14, verses 25 through 40. If you never read anything else in the Joseph Smith translation, this one in Genesis 14 is enough. Chapter 14, verses 25 through 40. Joseph Smith translation. It's right after the Bible dictionary. These are the excerpts that are too lengthy for inclusion in the footnotes. Okay? Well, brothers and sisters, what's the purpose of all this? The purpose of all this is to inspire us to seek for something higher. It's always kind of the core of our lessons, isn't it? Always kind of the core. I spoke at a funeral yesterday to a dear sister that I've known for years. Our last conversations was, she died at 88. Our, her la- our last conversation was that you leave this life with an advantage. We've talked about this. It's all about advantages and disadvantages. The more of an advantage you can attain to while you're in mortality behind the veil in a fallen world called hell, the more of an advantage you can obtain there and then the greater will be your glory and your progress in the world to come. We have to seek for everything that we can. And never be satisfied with less. Never. Again, let me just close by quoting this one thing by President Nelson. I urgently plead with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. And uh, one of the last things he said here is, how do we do this? I thought I'd throw this one in you, because this is really neat. He gives a bunch of reading, study the scriptures, go to the temple. But he said this, and if you truly want more priesthood power, you will cherish and care for your wife, embracing both her and her counsel. Woohoo! Isn't that good? That's good. I love it. <laughs> I thought you ladies would like that. Well, brothers and sisters, love you, and I hope that's helpful to you tonight. Tonight's lesson is called Neutralize, and I think you'll like the avatar that Margie's put up. She's got this great avatar. I love the gospel. I am so grateful. I, I leaned over to my wife today in the middle of sacrament meeting. I felt angels close. We sang a, go- we sang a song called Dearest Children. God is near you. And as I sang the second verse, I felt angels close. I leaned over to my wife and I said, I am so grateful for the things that I know. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and the Messiah. Amen.